Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime episode here on my YouTube channel. Before we jump into it today, I do want to thank today's sponsor, which is HelloFresh. If you are unfamiliar with HelloFresh, HelloFresh is a meal delivery service and it's actually America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those annoying and tedious trips to the grocery store and makes home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. HelloFresh has so many different recipe options each week to help you break out of whatever recipe rut you're in. I know personally that happens to me all the time and HelloFresh has really helped me branch out a little bit when it comes to choosing what I wanna cook. Over 90% of HelloFresh's ingredients are sourced directly from growers to ensure that you're receiving the freshest recipes straight to your doorstep. HelloFresh lets you enjoy cooking dinner and makes things super convenient with having their recipes be able to be made in 30 minutes or less, sometimes even 20 minutes. I know my personal favorite from HelloFresh has been their Parmesan pasta. It is so good. So if you guys want to try out HelloFresh for yourself, you can go to hellofresh.com killer80 and you can use the code killer80 at checkout to get $80 off your first HelloFresh package. By the way, also includes free shipping. So if you go to hellofresh.com slash killer80, you will get $80 off your first HelloFresh box, including free shipping. I know you guys are going to absolutely love it. I'm gonna have all the links in the description box below. Thank you so much, HelloFresh, for sponsoring this video. And now let's move on with the case. So as you guys can tell by the title of today's video, today we are talking about the death of Kevin Ives and Don Henry. This is a very interesting case. And and it was one that was recommended by you guys. And when I looked into it, I was actually surprised for multiple reasons. Surprised on the fact that this case I have never heard before. I think there are very few true crime YouTubers who have covered this case. And I was also surprised to see that there was such little information out there about this case, which is why I think that there hasn't been a lot of coverage and media attention on it. This case happened in 1987. To be more specific, it was August 23rd, 1987, when both Don and Kevin were killed. Now this case was originally ruled as an accident, but over time it became very clear that this case was actually a homicide. So with that being said, let's just jump right on into it. Donald George Henry was born on September 20th, 1970 to his father, Curtis Henry. Unfortunately, I was not able to find what Donald's mother's name was. I was only able to find his father's name, which is Curtis. And Larry Kevin Ives, who went by the name Kevin, was born on April April 28th, 1970 to his parents, Linda and Larry Ives. The boys grew up in Alexander, Arkansas and Alexander is a very small town. To give you some context, I was not able to find the population in 1987. However, I was able to find the population in 2011. And in 2011, the population was just short under 3000. It was about 2,900. So it is a fairly small town. And I do wanna say that if you end up doing your own research on this case because I know some of you like to take what I give you and go off and do your own research which is great. A lot of the resources out there state that the boys lived in Bryant, Arkansas. So I did some digging and did some research and found that Bryant and Alexander are about a nine minute drive away from each other. So they're really not far at all but I just thought it was important to mention that just in case some of you guys do go off and do your own research. So Don and Kevin were best friends. They went to the same high school, they were seniors, and they were fairly popular. Unfortunately, because this case has such limited information out there, there really isn't that much on who the boys were before all of this happened, what their personalities were like, what they like to do in their free time, their hobbies, their likes, their dislikes. That really wasn't available when I was doing my research. So that's basically all we have to go off of when it comes to who these boys were. So because of that, we are going to jump right to the night of August 23rd, 1987. And on this particular night, Kevin and Don were staying at Don's house and based off of the description that was given to Don's house it was clear that there was a wooded area near his house a very woodsy type of area and Don enjoyed hunting and on this particular night the boys decided that they were going to go hunting they were going to leave Don's home a little after midnight and go into the woods and hunt a little bit so like I said they left Don's home a little bit after midnight and between that time when they stepped out of Don's home until about about 4 a.m. no one knows what happened to these boys no one knows what they ended up doing no one knows if they came in contact with anyone the only thing we know is that about 4 a.m. there was a 6,000 ton cargo train that was making its regular
regular run to Little Rock, Arkansas. While it was on the tracks heading at about 50 miles per hour, the engineer on the train, which is a man named Steven Schroyer, noticed something on the tracks in the distance. And as the train was getting closer to this object that was lying on the train tracks, Steven said he was able to realize that what was on the train track was actually the bodies of two boys, later to be discovered as Don Henry and Kevin Ives. He said that the boys were lying completely parallel next to each other in the same exact position. And once he realized that the boys were there and what was actually lying on the tracks in front of them, he said he did everything he could to try to stop the train. He honked the diesel horn multiple times. However, nothing that he was doing was working. And unfortunately, the train ended up hitting both of the boys. So after the accident, the employees on the train dialed 911 and authorities arrived to the scene at about 4.40 a.m. When authorities arrived, they found Don's 22 caliber rifle lying next to him on the tracks. And according to Steven, while he was on the train and before the train had actually hit the boys, there was a green tarp laying over the boys' bodies. Now, I'm not sure if it was fully covering them or if it was covering half of their bodies or what the deal was because that was never disclosed in any of the research that I did and I searched extensively on this green tarp because it comes into play later. However, by the time authorities arrived on the scene, this green tarp that Stephen claimed that he saw was nowhere to be found. And it has never been found to this day. And we're gonna get into that in a little bit. We're gonna talk about it. Now, when authorities arrived on the scene, obviously after being hit by a train, they were able to determine that Don and Kevin had unfortunately passed away. Their bodies had been taken to a medical examiner for an autopsy to be performed. And this autopsy, this first initial autopsy was performed by a doctor named Dr. Malik. Now, when this first autopsy was performed, the boy's death was ruled accidental. In this doctor's report, he said that the boys had smoked up to 20 marijuana cigarettes, so basically 20 joints, on the night of August 23rd, and because of that, it had led them to be in a drug-induced coma. And that is why when they were laying on the tracks together, they could not get up, basically, because they were in this weed-induced coma. Now, no one believed Dr. Malik's theory, not one person besides the authorities and Dr. Malik himself. The boys' parents were not satisfied with this whatsoever. According to them, they said that the boys did not involve themselves in drug-related activities. They never smoked. They never did drugs. So for them to have up to 20 joints in their system was unlike their character in every single way possible. Along with that, the boys' parents also questioned the position that the boys' bodies were found in. According to Stephen, he said that as the train was approaching the boys, the boys were laying completely parallel next to each other, flat on the tracks in the same exact way. And if they were in this drug-induced coma, you'd think they wouldn't be just laying the exact same way, flat, straight, no arm movement whatsoever. The boys' parents just found it to be very unlikely that they would just be coincidentally lying in the exact same way. Along with that, the boys' parents did not believe that they would have slept through the sound of a train horn. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if you've ever heard a train horn before. I live right next to a railroad track, so I hear them literally multiple times a day, and they are loud. I hear them from my house, so I can't even imagine how loud they are when you're actually there on the tracks. And the parents thought the same thing. They thought that even if the boys were under the influence of marijuana, they would still be able to hear these train tracks, know that they were coming, and at least attempt to move. Even if they couldn't get up quick enough, they would at least attempt to get up. There would at least be some movement to show that they were alive, but according to Stephen, there was none. Now, Don's father did come out and say that he didn't believe that this was just an act of the boys voluntarily lying on these train tracks. He said that Don having his rifle with him right next to him on the train tracks was a very big indicator for him because according to Don's father, he said that Don was extremely protective over his rifle. His rifle was like his baby. He always took care of it. He never wanted to do anything that would possibly get it scratched or messed up in any way. So the fact that he would just put his rifle on the gravel, knowing that it would probably get scratched or something could possibly happen to it, Don's father just did not believe that that was something that Don would do. Now, because of Don and Kevin's parents' concerns, they went to the authorities and they asked the authorities to reopen this case, to look into it again, because ever since the first autopsy came back and the death was ruled accidental, authorities never looked at this case again. They said, it's accidental, let's move on, we're done here. But according to the boy's parents, they knew that there was more to this and they went to police and they pleaded with the police to try and open this case up again and for them to take a second look at it. But the authorities
authorities were really just not having it and they wouldn't do it. Now, after they were getting so much pushback from the authorities, Don and Kevin's parents went ahead and ended up hiring a private investigator. Now, this private investigator's first task was to go to the police department, just like the parents did, and ask the authorities to reopen the case. However, when he did this, he received the same amount of pushback that Don and Kevin's parents did. So collectively, the private investigator and the boy's parents came together and decided that they were going to hold a press conference. This press conference was going to be held in the hopes that it would A, bring light to the boy's case and let other people aware of it and make other people in the community aware of it so if they had any information to come forward. And B, it kind of put a lot of pressure on the police to reopen this case. And this press conference actually worked because just a day after this press conference was held, authorities reopened this case. So once this case was reopened, there was a prosecutor by the name of Richard Garrett. Now, Richard Garrett, like I said, prosecutor, once he heard about this case, he made it his mission to find justice for these boys. He ended up having Don and Kevin's body exhumed in order for there to be a second autopsy performed to get a second opinion on the boy's cause of death. Now, when this second autopsy was performed, it was performed by a different doctor than the first. And the results when they came back were extremely, extremely different from the first autopsy. In this second autopsy, this medical examiner found that instead of the 20 joints that the first doctor claimed the boys had been smoking, boys only had enough contents for about one to three joints in their system. So nowhere near the 20 that this first doctor was stating that they had. Along with that, this doctor said that the boys would have had to have over 4,000 times the amount of THC that was actually in their system in order for them to be in a drug-induced coma. And if you are familiar with THC and smoking and things like that, you know that there's really, you can't get in a coma. It's, it's not impossible, but it's very, very, very difficult and really unheard of to get in a drug-induced coma from just weed. It usually doesn't happen unless the possibility of something was laced and the boys didn't know. However, this doctor said the boys needed over 4,000 times the amount of THC that was found in their system and the only drugs that were found in their system were THC. This new medical examiner said that there was evidence to conclude that when they were on the train tracks, one of the boys was already dead to begin with and the other one was unconscious. So because of that, the boy's death was ruled from what was an accidental death to now probable homicide. Now, like I said, Richard Garrett was all over this case, Prosecutor Richard Garrett, and his next step in this case was figuring out what the heck was the deal with this green tarp that I mentioned earlier. Stephen was 100% convinced that there was a green tarp on the boys when he was driving up in the train. However, when the authorities arrived, there was no green tarp in sight. And Stephen said when he told the authorities about the green tarp the night of the boys' deaths, that the authorities just kind of brushed it off and because they couldn't see it and because they couldn't find it, they just kind of assumed that it wasn't a thing and they moved on. Now, Stephen did come out and there's a quote that he said that I want to read to you guys because it was in 1988, so just a year after the boys' deaths, and he made a comment regarding this green tarp and he said, quote, that to me would be like questioning the existence of the boys on the track because what's real is real and what's not is not. And it was there as well as the boys, end quote. And what he's really referring to there is the fact that this green tarp was just as real as the boys were. He saw the boys on the track and he saw the green tarp on the track. That's what he means by what's real is real. The boys were real, the green tarp was real. Now, regardless, like I said, to this day, this green tarp has never been found. And I find it interesting because if you think about it, if the boys got hit with this green tarp, there should be evidence of it somewhere. Even if it was completely shred and tore into pieces, there would be little findings of it here and there. Authorities would be able to find it. I don't know if they just didn't look for it because they ruled this death as accidental right from the get-go or if it wasn't anywhere to be found. But if you think about it, why would this engineer lie about seeing a green tarp? It literally makes no sense. Like what does he gain from saying that there was a green tarp when there really wasn't? So so following the second autopsy, there was then a third and final autopsy performed on the boys. And when this happened, there was a new finding that took this case into a complete different direction. After the third autopsy, the medical examiner discovered that there was evidence of stab wounds on one of the boys' bodies, indicating that he had been stabbed multiple times. On the other one of the boys, there was a head injury. And what this head injury looked like was it looked like one of the boys had been hit in the back of the head 
with what appeared to be, and this is what the medical examiner said, a gun, the bottom of a gun. And Don did have a gun with him that night. He had a 22 caliber rifle. So we go from an accidental death with 20 marijuana joints to probable homicide because the boys only had one to three joints in their system. And one of them was presumed to be dead already when they were on the train tracks and the other unconscious to now stab wounds and a head injury. So based off of these new findings, this case was now moved from probable homicide to just straight homicide. Now, six weeks following the boy's death, Richard Garrett was doing some research and he actually came across a very similar case to the boys that had taken place just several years prior to their death. In 1984, 26-year-old Billy Hainline and 21-year-old Dennis Decker were found lying motionless on train tracks in Hogden, Oklahoma, and they had been struck by a train as well. Now, this case to this day, the Billy and Dennis case is still unsolved. When an autopsy was performed and drugs and alcohol were looked at in their system, it was discovered that the boys were near the legal limit of being drunk. Dennis and Billy is what we're talking about. Dennis and Billy were near the legal limit of being drunk. So they weren't even drunk. They were just heavily buzzed and very tipsy. They weren't even at the legal limit of being drunk yet. Now the county coroner ruled Billy and Dennis's death to be accidental. However, the medical examiner was not comfortable with doing that. And he actually marked this cause of death as unknown. The case was reopened in 1985. However, to this day, it still remains unsolved. And it's just very interesting looking at the similarities of these two cases. In both cases, we're talking about two young men who are lying in basically the exact same positions because Billy and Dennis's body were found in the exact same position as Kevin and Don's body were. And we're also talking about two different states, the two completely different states that this is happening in and multiple years apart. But with the similarities, it definitely is very strange. However, regardless of that fact, Billy and Dennis's case, like I said, is unsolved and there are no suspects in that case. Now the police work in Don and Kevin's case was actually embarrassing. Like they had really just marked this case is accidental from the get-go and didn't look twice, didn't look back. And the sheriff of the police department, which was a man named Sheriff Steed, he actually refused to allow any funds to be poured into the investigation of the boy's death. Along with this, he also lied about sending the boy's clothes to the FBI. He said he was going to send them to the FBI, but instead he ended up sending them to the Arkansas State Crime Lab. Now, luckily, Sheriff Steed was not reappointed the sheriff's position and he was taken off of the boy's case once these findings were discovered. So along with the sheriff and the fact that the boy's death was ruled accidental, because it was ruled accidental, police didn't follow the proper protocol that they would have if this death was looked at as a possible homicide or if possible foul play was involved. They didn't collect evidence. There wasn't a lot of detail that went into it. There were so many things that weren't done because this case was ruled accidental from the get-go. And by the time the case was ruled homicide, there really wasn't anything to go off of because authorities hadn't preserved possible evidence like they would have if they thought that this was foul play. So at this point, we have two young boys' bodies, Don and Kevin, and their bodies were found parallel next to each other on train tracks. You have the inconsistencies in the autopsies, which ranged from accidental to homicide. This is obviously not the case of two boys who smoked 20 joints and decided to lay on train tracks together and not get up, you know? There's a lot more to this case. Now, as if things couldn't get any more suspicious, there were multiple deaths that actually happened after the boys had died that really tied into the boys investigation. There was a man named Keith McCaskill and Keith McCaskill worked as a informant for the lawyer of Don's parents. Keith McCaskill was asked to take aerial photos of the crime scene, which was the train tracks. And not long after he was asked to take these photos, Keith was actually found murdered. On January 22nd, 1989, there was a man named George Collins who had been planning to testify to a grand jury in the trial for the boys. However, However, he was also murdered before he was ever able to do that. Then in March of that same year, 1989, there was another man who had been subpoenaed as a witness and he had also gone missing before he was ever able to do that. Now, all of these deaths are still unsolved. There are no suspects, there is no people of interest, there is no nothing in that. But I don't think it's a coincidence that those three people who were tied to this investigation, whether they were going to testify or help get aerial photos or help in the investigation in any way, they end up dead. So that really is all the factual information we have on this case. And I know it's so frustrating. I was literally going, doing my research being like, there has to be more. There literally has to be more. How is there not 
not more of this out there, but there really isn't. So because of that, we're gonna jump straight into the theories. So the big theory in this case is that the boys had stumbled across a drug trafficking ring. Like I mentioned, Don's house kind of led back to a wooded area and wooded areas are fairly common for drug trafficking rings to be held and stationed, I guess. That's not the right word, but you understand what I'm saying. The theory here goes that the boys ended up walking into the woods and when they did that, they stumbled across a drug deal or they stumbled across something that they weren't supposed to see. And because of that, they ended up getting killed because whoever saw them wanted them to keep their mouth shut, didn't want them to have to worry about the boys talking. So they ended up killing them. Richard Garrett had come out and said that this area of Arkansas was actually a big drug trafficking hub at the time. And there is a former wrestler and his name is Billy Haynes. And Billy Haynes came out and said that he was actually a part of this drug trafficking ring in Arkansas. He said that he was hired sometimes to be security for the drug trafficking ring. And he worked this job through the 1970s and the 1980s. Now, according to him, there was a politician drug dealer. Billy claimed in a videotaped statement that one of the men in the trafficking ring had him distribute cocaine to people in the government who wanted it. And he said that in the 1980s, he himself was introduced to a politician drug dealer. Billy claimed that in 1984, this politician drug dealer asked him to kill Robert F. Kennedy's son. Billy also said in August of 1987, and I'm gonna look over here so I get the quote right. He said, quote, I was contacted by the Arkansas criminal politician and was asked if I would provide muscle at an Arkansas drug stop. The criminal politician suspected that some drug money drops were being stolen, end quote. Billy then went on to say that while conducting security during a drug purchase, he witnessed Don and Kevin being murdered because they had seen the drug purchase go down. Billy said that the actual people who murdered Don and Kevin were also working for the same criminal politician that he was at the time. And after coming forward with this information, Billy actually met with Linda, Kevin's mother in 2016 and told her as well as her private investigator, everything that he knew about every single person that was there that night. Now, I personally can see this theory coming true. I can see this theory happening. I also think, you know, why would why would Billy kind of out himself in this if this was not something that actually happened? What does he really have to gain out of this? It doesn't really seem like something that you would want to insert yourself in. I don't know. It just it just seems weird to make this up if this is not true. You've seen it before. It's not impossible. People make up stuff all the time. But for whatever reason, I just feel like this one's a little different. And like I said, it's not uncommon for these drug deals and drug purchases to go on in wooded areas. It's actually very very, very common. And if Don and Kevin saw something that they weren't supposed to see, if this politician didn't want the boys to out him, it definitely could have ended in their death, unfortunately. Now, another theory in this case was one that came from a witness. And this witness said a week prior to the boy's death, there was actually a man. And this man was not really known to anyone in the town. Like I said, it's a small town, kind of everyone knows everyone, but no one really knew this man. No one had ever seen him before. And he was dressed in military attire and he was walking around the train tracks when he was seen and because this person said that he they just got a weird vibe from him so he ended up calling the authorities and told the authorities about this man and when the authorities arrived to the train tracks to kind of just see what was going on see who this man was the authorities actually approached this man and when they did that this man took out a gun and completely just open fired and ran away the man had not been seen again for another week and until he was seen on the night of the boy's deaths walking around the train tracks for a second time. So the theory here is that this man could have possibly had something to do with the boy's death. My only question in this theory is the fact that it would have been two against one and Don had a gun with him. Two against one in this situation, I just don't really know how well that would have worked out and having to drag both of the bodies onto the train tracks, it just seems like a 
lot more work and if you think about motive obviously there's no justifiable reason but when you question motive what motive would this man have to kill the boys why would he want to do that and why would he go into so much effort to then take their bodies and put them on the train tracks and make it look accidental you know if he was just wanting to kill someone to kill someone he could have just killed them and left them in the woods but putting them on the train tracks makes it look like this was trying to be a cover-up they were trying whoever did this was trying to prove that this was an accident and not a homicide now the last theory we have in this case is police cover-up a lot of people have concluded that because the police work in this case was so god-awful that this had to be a police cover-up of some kind that the boys could have possibly seen something that they weren't supposed to see or heard something that they weren't supposed to hear when it came to police work or saw the authorities do something and because of that this was a police cover-up in some way i think it's possible that this police cover-up could have been tied to the possible politician drug trafficking ring i think that connection makes more sense but the police conducting this all on their own it's not impossible but i think it's more possible and more probable that this was connected to the politician drug trafficking ring but that's really all we have on this case you guys i'm going to leave information in the description box about anonymous tip hotlines which you could call if you are ever worried about your safety being in jeopardy people you love safety being in jeopardy but you know something about a case nothing is too small nothing is ever too small so if you know something and you're afraid to say something anonymous tip lines your identity will remain completely anonymous and i will have that linked in the description box below for you guys to check out along with some other phone numbers to the arkansas police department and an email address that you can reach them at as well if you know anything about this case with that being said you guys that is all from me today thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime episode here on my youtube channel if you're new here hi my name's savannah i make videos three days a week sunday tuesday thursday you should subscribe and join the family i love you guys so much i'll be back in a couple days with a brand new one bye guys